My name is Michelle Mosey and I'm the Senior Advisor Cybersecurity at the National Security College here at ANU. Today we've got Dr Irving Lacho from MITRE Corporation here to talk to us about active cyber defence. Now this is a really hot topic across government and industry at the moment and we're very privileged to have Dr Lacho here to talk to us about this really interesting subject. Welcome Irv, it's great to have you here. Thank you Michelle. Um, active cyber defense, what can you actually tell us about it? Well, uh, the first thing is active cyber defense is not hacking back, which is often the way it's uh, viewed. Um, what's interesting about active cyber defense is it describes a set of capabilities that organizations can take to defend themselves that lie somewhere between passive defenses and cyber hygiene, which is important and necessary, mm -hmm. and hacking back or offensive cyber, which really only government can do legally. And in between those two extremes, there are a range of actions that organizations can take to protect themselves. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what they can do or what they should do from a legal and policy perspective. And so that's why it's such a fascinating topic to discuss. Right. So talking about active cyber defense, could you give us, you know, some examples, clearly the cyber hygiene piece, we've done a lot of talking in, uh, in government around the ASD Essential 8, yep. and that's really classified as, as the hygiene type of activities. Yes. Could you expand a little bit more about ACD? <laughs> I know that that's, you know, a, a little acronym there. So no, 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 but, no, uh, that's, you're, you're spot on. That's exactly right. So, um, yeah, so let's say, uh, you know, you're doing your, your passive defense as your essential eight. That's important and that's necessary. Perhaps you can start to do things like create synthetic environments in your enterprise that can pull adversaries in so you can gather intelligence on the kind of activities they're doing. That's a little more active, right? Yeah. So you're actually doing things to change their behavior. Mm. You want them to go here. You want to watch them. Maybe you take an additional step of feeding them false information. Right. So now if, they're, if their goal is to try to steal your intellectual property, maybe you're giving them false information, which hopefully then requires them to spend a lot of time and effort to determine if what they've got is, is real or not real. And that's helping you um, confuse them and maybe deter them from coming at you again because they realize, oh my gosh, it's so much work. Mm. And um, essentially raising the cost. And, yeah. and that's, that's sort of one of the key outcomes that... Uh, lots of defenders look for raising the cost and making making ourselves an unattractive target. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, another example might be to plant some uh, code in documents that you're trying to protect. So if they're stolen, they can beacon mm -hmm. uh, and alert either you or the authorities that they've left your premises and are heading to some country you don't want them to go to. Right. Um, so that's another example of something that's a little more active and mm -hmm. not part of the essential aid or the normal cyber hygiene that companies do. Sure. Um, so there must be risks and trade-offs when you start to do this because when we look at um, potentially planting incorrect information that we know may be stolen, yeah. there's a risk that, that potentially comes along with that. If you, you know, can you expand a little bit on that? A absolutely. Uh, again, that's what makes this such a challenging issue is there are clearly benefits to a number of these techniques. However, as you point out, there are, uh, there are a lot of risks. So there's a risk of potential collateral damage if you're doing things outside of your network and you unintentionally harm someone while you're trying to interact with the adversary. Mm -hmm. You can potentially escalate things. So maybe you, you do increase the work factor, the cost to the adversary, and maybe their response, rather than saying, oh gosh, okay, I'm just going to leave you alone, is I'm going to ramp up and I'm going to make you pay mm. for making my life more difficult. And they try to wipe your systems. Um, and there's also international implications because a lot of this activity involves uh, nation states and things that you do may actually affect another nation. And so you can actually unintentionally have an impact on global norms, mm. on economic relationships and things that are completely unanticipated and perhaps not helpful. Yeah, I think you raise a really interesting point there about the international dimensions mm. of utilizing active cyber defense. Um, there are challenges domestically, let alone internationally. Um, where do you think we kind of are in, in that space um, in terms of some of the legal or compliance issues, getting agreements? Uh, we're not very far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, especially internationally. So at the national level, 
different countries have different laws in place. Some uh, do not allow any kind of active cyber defense at all. Mm -hmm. Others are more uh, open-ended. Some countries don't have laws at all. Um, but to your point about internationally, we have a bit of a challenge there because international law as it currently stands generally does not address this kind of corporate level activity. Most international laws are focused on nation states. Mm -hmm. So the laws of armed conflict and humanitarian law and that sort of thing. Yeah. Even the cybercrime convention, uh, the Budapest convention doesn't really address these kinds of issues. Yes. And so there is no international legal framework. So we really need to start by building maybe a set of norms uh, that guide best practices or acceptable kinds of behaviors, even that's going to prove challenging because if five countries agree on, a, on norms, but, you know, 30 don't, and there's activity emanating from those other 30, then mm. uh, you may be potentially constrained. So it's, it's quite a challenge. Absolutely. And, I mean, even going forward and describing or actually setting out the norms, there should be a range of stakeholders involved in doing that. Am That's I right. correct in saying it shouldn't just Absolutely. be a government-driven activity? Absolutely. You're, you're exactly right. And that's what makes this even more complex is governments can take these kinds of actions. They have the authority um, to do so. The question is, can companies or private sector organizations? And uh, again, that, that varies country by country. But again, they're potentially operating now internationally. And so you have, you have nations interacting, you have companies interacting, and it could get very complex, right? So you can have companies affecting companies and companies affecting other governments and governments affecting, right? And it's this big morass mm. of activity. And it can't just be addressed, to your point, at the nation state level, because what makes this an interesting issue is that, is that companies are taking these actions. Companies are doing things outside of their own networks. It is happening. Yes. And so yeah. how do we... How do we get them to act in a way that, yes, allows them to protect themselves, but is doing so in a way that's conducive to international security, international economic uh, concerns? I think that's actually a really interesting point in terms of how, how, do, we, how do we bring it together? What is OK and what is no, not OK, especially when you start to look at an international level? And there are countries and nation states and others that play by the rules and others who don't. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the trick in getting that mm -hmm. balance. Um, how do you, you have any thoughts around how we might even just make baby steps towards doing some of that? Mm. Um, so uh, one way to start is try to find areas where there might be some agreement. Um, so for example, um, countries have agreed through the UN, through the GGE process, uh, to not attack each other's computer security emergency response teams. Mm -hmm. right, so they're off limits. So it's kind of like the Red Cross. You don't, you don't go after the Red Cross kind of thing, right? Uh, and countries have signed up for that. Even Russia right, has signed up for that. Um, are there things we could agree to in the active cyber defense area where everyone just says, yeah, okay. So for example, hack, like I mentioned, hacking back. Like mm -hmm. you can start there. Most everyone agrees that a company shouldn't be free anytime they want to hack anyone else in the world they want. I mean, that's, that's actually cybercrime. That's what we're trying to stop, that's right? That's right, that's um, right. So, you, you know, but then th as you start to draw lines uh, in, the, in the sand or create norms, it gets very, very difficult. Um, and to your point, which I think is an excellent one, which is interesting, is on the one hand, the more clarity there is around this issue, the better c companies will be able to make uh, decisions about the, the benefits and risks of an action because mm -hmm. they understand the potential consequences, right? Yes. But to your point, which is a very interesting one, is if there's a level of ambiguity about what can be done, at some, there are arguments that that might actually be helpful in the sense that if, if um, bad guys don't know what you can and can't do back to them, maybe that uncertainty actually deters them as opposed to they have a very clear understanding of what companies can do back to them. And so they can play right up until that. Well, this is the, the, the issue with red lines in the yes, sand, right? Yeah, yes. People then game it. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, I've heard you speak before about, you know, do nothing option, which is kind of somewhat where we are now and complete Wild West. Um, and I think that is the issue. Instead mm. of maybe building up, we look at it from winding back. Mm. Um, as you said, there are a lot of companies out there now who are actually actively participating in active cyber defense. 
um, and they are supporting governments in order to do so or, or sharing that information. Mm. So it's a really interesting topic in itself, active cyber defence. How do we do it? How do we implement it in a way that keeps us safe and secure? Um, yeah, so... Yeah, and let me and let me just build on just, that that last point. Yeah. Just what the public private cooperation aspect is really critical, and that actually goes both ways. So, for example, in the UK right now, there is a government led active cyber defense program out of their national cybersecurity center, where the government is reaching out to industry, uh, so internet service providers, mm -hmm. email providers, uh, internet uh, um, internet exchange point providers and enlisting them in steps that are absolutely active cyber defense types of techniques, yes. but they're coming from the government mm. and industry is helping the government execute that strategy. So that's one way to do it. The other way is to think about industry wanting to move out and perhaps having government work with them. So whether it's a botnet takedown or whether it's the government sanctioning certain private sector activities or the sharing of threat information. Um, and so there is absolutely this public private partnership aspect that I think is very important. Mm, and we're seeing examples of that obviously in the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's probably no time more so than now that it's important for government and industry to work together and certainly face challenges like this and get academia involved in helping us answer some of the big absolutely. questions around cyber, uh, cyber defense, cyber security, and how we utilize it in that global sense. Mm -hmm. So. On that, I will finish up and thank you very much, Irv, for spending some time with us this morning. My pleasure. Thank Thanks. you.